I'm Tim from TimSteppingOut.com and today I wanted to talk about why I don't think Jesus Christ ever existed. About a year ago I started becoming more aware of a pretty compelling notion that Jesus Christ never existed and the roots of, of this argument um, are kind of multifold. One, there's really a lot of historical silence where uh, there shouldn't be. I mean, people should have noticed Jesus. Uh, people who were specifically interested in some of the things that Jesus was supposedly talking about would have certainly been interested. Uh, Philo of Alexandria is one who was, he was very interested in um, a Hellenized version of Judaism that talked about the Logos and the Word of God coming to earth and binding all things together. You actually see um, what appears to be a reference to Philo of Alexandria in the Pauline letters, I think it's 2 Corinthians, where, he, where Paul is talking about the glue that's binding all things together and it being the word of God, which is a clear reference to the Logos. Um, and so as I investigated it more, I became aware of things that, that a lot of, of people who are making this argument are talking about. For instance, uh, Richard Carrier talks a lot about euhemerization and this process of converting um, archangels or other sort of godlike figures into humans. And this was a very common thing in the Greek world. Uh, you know, if you look at Zeus... He was always coming to earth and, and impregnating human women and creating sort of um, godlike men. You know, you see that with Perseus and Dionysus and, and uh, all, all sorts of characters like that. And so I started looking into it. I started looking at a lot of the source material, a lot of uh, the earliest texts I could find to try to find a moment in time to see if there is one. Uh, where Jesus converted from a non-human into a human. And um, I'm not necessarily going to talk about that today, but what I did find interesting uh, as I was looking through it was a story described by Josephus, and I've, I've talked about this in another video. Um, in Wars of the Jews, which was written in 75, uh, about five years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which would have been a, a terrible, horrible, uh, no good, very bad day for uh, Jews, not only in Jerusalem, but uh, all throughout the diaspora, too. Um, but the story is about Jesus ben Ananias, a guy who had come to town several years before the temple's destruction, started reciting a prophecy citing it over and over and over again. He was um, persecuted by the powers that be. He was driving everybody nuts. He was eventually, um, he went into the temples to recite his, his prophecy. He was taken to the Roman governor, Albinus, uh, who was occupying a role which was 30 years earlier occupied by Pontius Pilate, the, the famous murderer of Jesus Christ. And uh, Albinus whipped him too and, and beat him and tried to uh, get him to, to knock it off and, and to understand why he was doing what he was doing. So this is around the year 64 maybe. Never got it out of him. Um, and so he went along his way uh, doing the same thing <laughs> for the next several years until uh, uh, he on the Evidently, on the day when the temple was destroyed, he was up by the temple saying, Woe to Jerusalem, woe to this holy house, woe to the people of Jerusalem, and woe to me. Uh, siege tal uh, siege um, stone hit him, and the temple knocked the temple down, and uh, that was sort of the end of Jesus ben Ananias. And I started thinking about it. I mean, a lot of people have noticed similarities between Jesus Ben Ananias and Jesus Christ. I'm not nearly the first one to notice it. But I started thinking about what that story would have read like to a disillusioned Jew in the years following the temple's destruction. And I think it would have, I think a lot of people would have read that and thought, 
that was a message from God. <laughs> God sent Jesus Ben Ananias to prophecy to tell us what's wrong. Um, what I also think might have been going on with a group of people who noticed this story, read this story, and found it very important is that they might have been concluding that the God that sent the prophets and um, created the law wasn't actually the God who sent Jesus, that it was a different law, uh, that it was a different God. And there are things within the Josephus story that I suppose could have given rise to that. Um, you know, if you're saying, woe to the people of Jerusalem, woe to this holy house, maybe there's some kind of inversion, you know, if you're, if you're reading it like that, uh, that needs to be done in order to understand what Jesus Ben Ananias was trying to say. You know, and so when you read the Gospel of Mark, it reads an awful lot like the story that Josephus described, even sometimes borrowing word-for-word -word passages, the uh, gave up the ghost and um, uh, references to the four winds and uh, references to husbandmen. You know, evidently Jesus Ben Ananias was a husbandman from the poor class. And so I think what was simultaneously going on was people were reading this and thinking that G that God that this unknown God had sent Jesus. And that, as far as I can tell. Um, is uh, gave rise to this notion of the fall from the Godhead, uh, or at least maybe it contributed to it. It sort of fell into this idea, especially to people who uh, were Greek readers who were familiar with Plato and Pythagoras, um, and this notion of uh, the monad giving rise to the uh, to the nous, which was the spirit, and then the nous giving rise to chaos, and eventually you're getting material. Uh, so that was, I mean, mm -hmm. you see that in all sort of Gnostic uh, literature going through from the Sethians and the Valentinians, where, where they're basically religionizing Plato and Pythagoras. Uh, but I think that the inklings of this came with Cerinthus, uh, who perhaps wrote Revelation, uh, whose theology perhaps fed into Mark. But what I think you have with Jesus Ben Ananias, particularly in this frame of time where things are really terrible for Jewish people, even in the diaspora, where I think Mark was from because he doesn't seem to have known anything about Judean culture or geography. I mean, he's talking about Jesus traveling way up 50 miles out of the way to go back to Galilee. I mean, it's something that would have been stupid to do. Um, and that the Sanhedrin is being called at night, which was their, their court system. Uh, the Sanhedrin wasn't allowed to be called at night. That's against the law. And, um, you know, so I, I think that there's just a lot of things that contribute to the idea that the Marx writer didn't know much about Judea. Uh, which makes it even more interesting, considering that Matthew, the supposed disciple of Jesus, uh, was really referencing a lot of Mark, which would be absurd for Matthew to do if he were actually um, a disciple of Jesus. Why would he need to do that? Um, but what I think you have with Jesus, Ben Ananias, is the clear underpinnings of a uh, occult figure. And I think that that gave rise to the story of Mark. But the other thing that I think happens when you start looking at it is that when you read G, uh, Josephus through this lens, that Josephus actually has useful information uh, about people that this God is sending, um, what you get, I think, is a... Uh, you, you start to see this pattern emerge over and over and over again. Uh, Josephus talks about a theudas, who has a band of followers, he's taking them down to the Jordan River, and he's pissing off the, the powers that be. And so the powers that be, I can't remember who sent uh, 
sent uh, someone to do something about it, but it, I think it was the Roman governor at the time, I can't remember who, but they send people to behead Theudas, who had been taking people down to the Jordan River. That sounds an awful lot like John the Baptist. Uh, and indeed, we do see more references to Theudas, one in Acts, which created the, the famous problem of Theudas, where Theudas is chronologically put before Judas of Galilee, where uh, Josephus makes it very clear that Judas of Galilee had come decades earlier than, than Theudas. You also th see Theudas in, uh, uh, supposedly he's the disciple of Paul, who uh, Theudas then taught Valentinus how to uh, talk to God. <laughs> you know, I mean, so clearly this, uh, this connection was not lost um, on, on some of these early Christians. And then you've got Simon Magus, the famous arch heretic, who uh, seems to be the father of all heresies. He's Adamus, who uh, was supposedly a friend of Felix, who was Albinus's predecessor. Uh, and he was, try he was playing matchmaker. And so he was also a magician, according to uh, Josephus. Um, where it, the real kicker to me, the real thing that just drives it home, was this story of Ananus ben Ananus, uh, which supposedly, um, dis which was in Antiquities 29. Supposedly, Ananus killed James, the brother of Christ. You know, that it, I mean, it even says in Josephus, he's the brother of Christ. I think this is a later interpolation, uh, namely because Ananus ben Ananus, uh, who killed James, he was a Sadducee, and a likely victim of the Sadducees would have been the Pharisees, and yet James is associated with the Essenes and the Ebionites, supposedly. Uh, so... It, it it seems weird that that uh, that this James that Ananus Ben Ananus killed is the same James uh, referenced in other stories, but the story goes that Ananus uh, he came from a long line of of high priests and he was appointed priest by Albinus the same Albinus who had whipped Jesus Ben Ananias and. Um, Ananus Ben Ananus was a power hungry tyrant who started grabbing power and he broke the law by assembling the Sanhedrin while Albinus was in Egypt. And the people started complaining about it, and they and so Albinus came back and he sent Ananus away. And as a res after that, Albinus appointed Jesus Bar Damnius to the high priest. What I think becomes clear if you just cross out the reference to the brother of the Christ is that James was not the brother of Jesus Christ. He was the brother of Jesus Bardamnius. <laughs> and that Albinus appointed Jesus Bardamnius to the high priest despite the Ananus family. So what I think happened was that the interpolator who stuck in the brother of Christ actually found the inspiration for James. It's just that James wasn't James the brother of Jesus Christ. He was the brother of Jesus Bardamnius and the original inventors of the story that was in Acts where, where um, James is stoned. Uh, he was actually uh, a depiction of, of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, Bardamnius. So what I think is going on is that Josephus was the encryption key and that his works were borrowed by Christian authors who later, who were seeking to historicize Jesus. Uh, it, it seems pretty clear to me. I mean, you just see it over and over again. You know, so the alternative is that Josephus, or, or that, that the characters described by Josephus, 
they actually knew the earliest Christians. But I just don't believe that, especially given that Mark doesn't seem to know anything at all about what was going on in, in Jerusalem. I think that um, he, they just borrowed from him because he had had stories about these supposedly holy or divinely inspired people. And they needed a legitimate source, and so they used um, the most famous historian of the time, at least one of them. So that's all I have to say. I don't think Jesus Christ existed. I think that he was just a formulation, perhaps from a prior theology um, that was indeed focused on uh, archangels and stuff like that, and uh, that he was evidence of a God coming to... Um, make things right, who was actually above the God of the Old Testament. That's what I think anyway. Um, I don't have blind certainty about it. It just seems like that's what was going on when you read it. So, thanks.